All right. So we are here uh, to, uh, to introduce the, the next panel um, I'll be hosting. And this uh, plenary panel is about use, utilizing new tools uh, to assess food system challenges. Um, and we are going to kick it off with a keynote uh, by Sibri Traore. Uh, All right, now I have my notes. Uh, so yeah, we're really happy to have Sibri here. Sibri uh, leads the digital agricultural cluster at ICRASAT um, and is also uh, one of the leaders of Manobi Africa where he has developed the concept of fidgetal agriculture, which is a com combination of physical and digital agriculture. And uh, he has extensive experience working in previous AGMIP projects, uh, as well as with the World Bank, with the NASA Servir West Africa program, Bill and Melinda Gates, and, and many other uh, activities. Uh, so we're really happy to have Sabri here. Uh, and over to you, Sabri, please. Thank you, Alex, and uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'm very uh, happy to be here and uh, thankful to AGMIP for inviting me uh, for this uh, presentation. I will uh, talk about util utilizing new tools and I added in brackets approaches to address food system challenges. And the reason I talk about approaches is because some of those tools are not necess necessarily very new, but the way we use them uh, can be. I want to uh, acknowledge a few colleagues who have joined me on this uh, um, presentation. Uh, Vijay Joshi is with uh, the University of Florida, uh, Janet Mutuku and Glory Wowo with ICRISAT, uh, Dan Osgood with Columbia University, and uh, Daniel Anros with uh, Manobi. First of all, food system challenges. Uh, so I take this picture that probably you know well about the global map of the food system and the question that I'm asking is what challenges are we aiming to address? Uh, the food system is a very complex uh, animal. Uh, there are many types of interactions that are all interconnected in different ways. AGMIP, I think, uh, has an opportunity to venture in that space and uh, um, the question is, do we really have a clear idea about which challenges we want to address and whether we have a, a good sense of the, the big picture? Um, one way to simplify the problem is perhaps to look at uh, this other slide taken from the internet, uh, which uh, reminds us that for one hungry person, there are two obese persons in the world. So we need to always think of uh, whether we actually ask always the right questions when we think about food production and food consumption. And um, these need probably to be reflected in our uh, research agendas. New tools or new approaches. So those are cartoons that I like to show. Uh, the third one is new, but the first one is well known by a researcher from CIRAD back in 1991 who said, uh, and that's the scientist on the left-hand side, we obtained this magnificent sorghum after so many years. And the farmer asks him, well, how does it taste? And the scientist answers, well, we don't even know if we can eat it. <laughs> so when um, I earlier was involved in AGMIP projects, one of the biggest epiphanies was when we started discussing what are we going to eat for breakfast in 30 years down the road? I think those are the kind of key questions that we need to ask when um, we think about tools and approaches. 25 years later, the World Bank does it again with this cartoon. This mobile app will help you uh, solve all your problems. And what I find interesting is that in the first case, the two, the scientist and the farmer were talking, but in the second, the, the ladies are just listening, but they're not thinking, they're, they're thinking otherwise, but not saying anything. So I'm asking myself in 25 years down the road again, in 2035, which is just uh, 13 years from now, 12, um, what are we going to present the farmer with? Is it going to be 
uh, something. Maybe I should have put a little bot or some chatbot or something there. Um, a prescriptions of do's and don'ts. And that's uh, precisely the kind of uh, mindset I think we need to adopt when we want to think about new tools and uh, ask ourselves critically, are we using tools in a different way or are we just repeating the same mistakes that we have done for a long time, uh, just taking advantage of technology? So this figure is also well known from Donella Meadows, who was one of the main thinks, thinkers about systems change. So as they say in the restaurant, do you want your systems change to be incremental or do you want it to be transformational? And um, the notes you see on the left-hand side were actually provided for most by Dan Osgood, who said, one of the problems that we have today is that many of the methods that we use including machine learning, including deep learning, AI, and you name it. They prescribe solutions that are not really driven by demand and driven by knowledge from the ground. So that is uh, something we need to consider more seriously as we move forward, that the dimensions of the system where we can affect more leverage are typically not biophysical in nature. They are more socioeconomic they're more behavioral, and they lie at a very different uh, level um, of, um, of, of um, uh, knowledge that uh, what we have been able to do so far. So I'm going to give a few examples of, uh, actually two examples of how we do this or how we approach this because we cannot pretend to do it yet. <coughs> the first one, is taken from a project that uh, we are running with um, University of Pittsburgh, University of Florida, University of Arizona, uh, funded by DARPA, uh, which is called Heuristics for um, Hyperlocal Elicitation and Understanding of Risks to Stability in Complex Systems. What this project aims to do is to develop technology packages that within six weeks of entering a new country or a new value chain or a new production basin are capable of producing skillful predictions of not only yield, but also farmer behavior and choices. So among the tools that we bring in those uh, technology packages, uh, there is machine reading. So machine reading um, is, um, I could say, a, a, a subset perhaps of machine learning that aims to automate the extraction of content, uh, causal relationships, etc., from text. So uh, in this, for example, uh, we submit to a machine reading workflow 100 papers that are in the literature, and we ask that workflow to extract the um, a number of parameters that could be used, for example, to initialize a process-based model like DSAT. So that is one type of input that we are looking at, you could argue is a, a new tool. The second is remote sensing, because over the past five to six years, there has been really a breakthrough in uh, the ability of satellite Earth observation to provide data that is actionable at the local scale. That was mostly the consequence of uh, the Copernicus missions by the European St Space Agency that provide us 10 meter data um, every um, five days or so, sometimes uh, <coughs> less in some places. And um, free of charge, not only for public and research use, but also for commercial use. And that's uh, very transformative. So what you can um, see here are four maps where we look at the estimated flooding date. Monitoring flooding from satellite is a very, is a very low hanging fruit. It's pretty simple. It's pretty straightforward. And you can show in this um, um, delta of the Senegal River Valley from one year to the next, the enormous variation that there is in the flooding date that farmers actually implement 
And that is critical because when you crop rice in the Senegal River Valley during the dry hot season, if you are late to flood and therefore to plant, you will be late to harvest. And if you harvest late, you will harvest under the rain. If you harvest under the rain, the quality of your rice is going to quickly degrade. Um, it will also diminish uh, the sales price and you will expose yourself to default on your loan. If you, defa if you default on your loan, the bank will not recover their loan and therefore the next year they're not going to finance you. And why this is critical is because in smallholder agriculture, uh, we cannot afford not to inject more inputs of quality and at a low price. In Africa, as you know, we only use about 13 kgs of nitrogen per hectare, which is one order of magnitude almost lower than what people do in Asia. So how can we pretend to reach the level of productivity that uh, is achieved there um, uh, without increasing our inputs, without money? you won't have fertilizer. So those are the kinds of examples that we um, combine to then generate uh, yield forecasts. So this map that you see, which can be implemented here on a five arc minute grid, but can be implemented at any scale, is actually only driven by um, online graded rainfall data like chirps, um, parameters, parameter values that have been automatically extracted from literature and by remote sensing that ex essentially provides the, uh, the key agronomic events to set the um, environment under which the model operates. And the yields that we obtain are in the reasonable range of what is actually measured and published by the government. If you look now at the translation into a production figure, you will realize that um, most of the production is in the Delta area, whereas in the higher valley, there's very little. So we're very interested in this because we're working with uh, Lor and a few other colleagues, uh, Madina also, uh, Dilis on a German funded project where we want to look at uh, the sustainability of rice production using the SRI approach. And the problem that we face in this uh, particular case is that we are torn between one region, which is highly uh, intensified and productive, Dagana, and where you have all kinds of financing already in place that can actually cover the cost of collecting data at scale, uh, but that is not very fit to SRI because of saline intrusions. And therefore you need to leach that salt with more irrigation, more water. And uh, the other regions of Porto are more fit, but there's no one to finance. So these are examples that I want to give um, to also explain that we can use that information to understand behavior. <coughs> so what you can see on the right hand side, if you look at the red curve, this is the remote sensing estimates of cumulative flooded area over the dry hot season 2023. And what you will observe is that there's an initial increase that we know is associated with the date when uh, the bank said they were going to finance. But then it levels off around uh, the 5th of March. And then it doesn't move for another 10 days or so. And this is because after the bank said they would finance, actually the money didn't flow. So the farmers told they're flooding. So remote sensing can actually uh, assess the response of a particular management by the farmer to the environmental condition, in this case, the provision of funding. You will see that the government doesn't see it, the, neither the orange, which is the, the, the prepared land, the plowed land, nor the green curve, which is the uh, planted land actually reflect that inflection at all. So we are working with this to also monitor not only what the farmer does, but also what the banker does. And that's especially important because of uh, what I explained earlier. On the left hand side, what you can see is the difference between a satellite estimate 
of uh, the floating date and an agent reported estimate of the floating date that is actually declarative data or observed data. So what happens is that over several thousands of fields with Manobi, we have agents who scout essentially farms. So they're responsible for between 100 and 200 farms and they rotate on a fortnight basis. The issue now is, are they going to be able to witness the floating event or are, going to have to, are they going to have to listen to the farmer as a declaration? And will they actually visit the spot or will the information be assumed or um, you know, inferred other ways? So what you can observe is that the agents uh, on the ground tend to estimate the floating date much earlier than the satellite. And we know that this is because the, uh, they rely mostly on the declaration of the farmer and the farmer declares the flooding date as the first day when he opens the, the water. And uh, the plot uh, could take a certain time to flood because those are conglomerate plot, plots of several hectares. So uh, there are certain um, issues that we need to be cognizant of. Another way to look at this is at the scale of the entire department. That's what I call unpack, unpacking the, the harvest uh, behavioral phenotype. Um, from 2019 to 2021, you can see in the lower hand side, the large maps that in 2020, the farmers may have planted on time, but then because of the lockdowns, interregional travel was halted and all the casual labor that they would typically uh, bring on board to harvest was not available. Conclusion, the harvest during the COVID year was very poor in terms of the quality because it was harvested very late. And what's intriguing is that if you look at a small subset at a different scale, and that's the uh, very top left part of the larger map that you see in the three inserts on the right, you can see exactly opposite phenomena. So things are not stationary across scales, they can be very different. And you can see that in the central part of an irrigated scheme in 2019, uh, apparently uh, farmers uh, planted or flooded late. Whereas in the periphery, which are typically West Lel, less well endowed farmers, they flooded early. During the COVID, it was just the opposite. And after the COVID, it was, um, everyone rushed to try and put their uh, plot in, in production. So these are really, we believe, useful pieces, sources of information that can be now used to uh, drive um, a process-based model. A second and last example I want to give is an extension of this approach to <coughs> the complicated problem of the relation between agriculture and mining in Ghana. Uh, in Ghana, there's a, a very prevalent practice right now, mostly in the Ashanti and Western region called Galamse, which means artisanal illegal mining. And uh, many farmers actually abandon farming to start uh, looking for gold on their farm, sometimes out of their farm elsewhere. So we use exactly the same approaches by uh, essentially <coughs> mining documents to um, conduct sentiment analysis and then geocode where uh, that's, uh, that particular belief has been uh, coming from. That's the kind of map you see on the, on the left hand side. And then this is combined with a remote sensing uh, analysis at any given point in time to then uh, inform and modify the prior and the posterior distribution of the likelihood of a farmer or any other land user converting his or her land from an existing land use type to Galamse. And this can be informed by many things, <coughs> but what you can see on the left hand side of this screen is the speed at which between 2017 and 2023, the red area has expanded. It's absolutely like it's a runaway process. And this land most of the time is then unfit for agriculture for many years. Um, and that is a problem which is not specific to Ghana. 
It's all across Africa. It's in Senegal, it's in Mali, it's in Niger, it's in Uganda, it's in Zimbabwe, it's everywhere. So understanding um, how to use those tools also to predict transitions out of agriculture is extremely, we believe, um, pertinent because um, many things cannot be explained uh, just by looking at uh, um, imagery or assuming that you know the problem. Well, one of the funny beliefs that uh, I came across, uh, we came across in Ghana was that farmers believe that typically under a cocoa field, you have gold. Of course, uh, biophysically, the relationship is not very clear. But there are two actual good reasons for this. The first is the British during colonial times, when they went in the forest, I was at the time Ghana was called the Gold Coast for a good reason. Everywhere they could find gold, they would plant cocoa because they would find their way back to the gold by looking at the cocoa plant. The second is cocoa is actually the most unequitable value chain you can imagine. Farmers who plant cocoa are actually poorer than farmers who plant millet. It's ludicrous because cocoa has a very high value as chocolate in the, uh, in the market. But during COVID, we learned that farmers who were planting cocoa were so poor, uh, they were making yields in the order of 350, 360 kgs per hectare, that uh, they were at a higher risk of converting their cocoa land into artisanal mining than farmers were doing another crop. So those are uh, beliefs and information that are useful to capture and to exploit when we want to understand how agricult agricultural systems evolve. So I think I'm, um, I guess I'm out of time. So those are my thoughts uh, going forward. Um, I'm quoting a few people, Donella Meadows, the most potent levers are not always the one you we think. Uh, that's an important one. Uh, Holger Meinke, whom many of us know uh, before, you can think of a new tool at, uh, as a decision support tool, think of it as a discussion support tool, because you first need to assess whether it brings you information that is actually um, um, beating what the farmer already knows, and that's uh, far from obvious in many cases. And then um, one of um, Cynthia's predecessors, uh, Dr. Haddad, said um, what you can see, too many people whose health would benefit from eating a more plant-based diet want to impose it on populations whose health, whose health would benefit from eating more animal-sourced food. And I'm, I'm trying to make a parallel between this quote and uh, all the excitement, for example, around agroecological intensification. Agroecological intensification is certainly good, but alone, I doubt that it will actually cut um, our uh, productivity improvement targets. And that is why when we think of using those new tools, we think of them not so much in terms of providing advisories to farmers on how to optimize the use of their existing resource, but more for de-risking uh, the investment uh, into smallholder value chains because what they lack is mostly money that allows them to purchase uh, fertilizers and seeds and other inputs at a controlled cost. And yes, uh, one comment I want to make is that I see a lot of us still in research trying to reinvent the wheel. I see it in the CGIR. I see it elsewhere. Um, there's not always, um, it's not always very cost effective to try to rebuild business models that are already running elsewhere. Um, and I take the example that I know best from Manobi because those people have already figured out how you build a self-sustaining data ecosystem that is based on um, uh, commodity transactions. We don't need to do this on their behalf. And uh, the same applies to a number of other problems. Um, um, in terms of um, capturing the intelligence, especially at a local scale. I want to acknowledge um, our donors, USAID, with NASA. That's mostly through the Servia West Africa project and DARPA for this heuristics project. 
along with the uh, partner institutions that I mentioned before. So with that, I am finished. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sibri. Please hold on a second. Uh, we can take some quick questions from the room before we go to our panel. Any questions from the room? Well, I'll, I'll ask uh, a, a starting question. I, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more on, on the kind of reinvention of the wheel that you were talking about at the end um, and, and how, how these, how Manobi and, and others have mm -hmm. uh, built up a data ecosystem that allows it to interact with the physical and digital spaces in that way. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether I can elaborate, but what I can say is that um, um, from the experience I've gained by working embedded in the private sector, uh, typically the private sector has an intuitive knowledge of uh, where the bottlenecks are. Um, and there are not a lot of um, research problems that we tend to propose or work on that if you submitted them to a business person, in that case, well, what helps is that the, the business person in question is a, is a scientist himself, so he has also experience of research, then um, you would gain a lot of time. So one of the examples that he was giving me the other day when I told him, well, if you thought of new tools uh, that would have the highest potential for um, uh, meeting the food system challenges, he was telling me, I can think of three. One, the risk smallholder value chains to ensure that once you've de-risked it, the banks actually finance them. And the third is uh, decarbonize agriculture, which obviously will create a number of other opportunities to make uh, the financing of smallholders more uh, affordable. So yes, there are several examples I can, uh, I, I can, I can probably think of in, uh, in later discussions, yeah. There are no other, oh, there's a question online, is it, Eric? Uh, yeah, uh, from Marie Spiker from on Zoom. Really fascinating work about the belief extraction. I'd love to know a bit more <laughs> detail on the data source for the sentiment analysis. Are you looking at mainstream media, social media, or something else? And somebody sends their appreciation for your frank and direct talk. Thank you for the, the question. Um, in terms of the belief extraction, most of the um, corpus of information we use so far is scientific literature. But we have started uh, looking at other sources. One that we are interested to investigate in Ghana is um, the rural radio transcripts. So we don't yet have access to those uh, radio transcripts, but Ghana has uh, a wide a community of rural radios where certainly you have talk shows and things like that where uh, farmers or other local actors will share a certain number of thoughts or ideas and um, what uh, I showed earlier with this map where you have this kind of shiny app uh, map that shows the geolocation of a particular belief imagine if we replace um, 80 uh, peer-reviewed papers by 80 streaming radio stations that are transcribed and fed into um, a machine reading workflow. Um, the granularity of the information we're going to extract is going to improve significantly. And then uh, we will be able to start uh, to see appearing in our very uh, localized communities, little dots that show, oh, here someone mentioned something about um, galamse or about uh, cassava cropping or about cocoa cropping or about uh, politicians or anything else and we know that it, it belongs to that community. So we are hopeful that we can do this. One of the big problems in Africa is that uh, social media are not as accessible and as um, um, how could say rich as they are in developed countries particularly in the rural areas. So 
that is something, however, that is bound to change and, and probably quite rapidly. So um, that's what I can say. Thank you very much. Sure. All right. Thanks again to Sabri. Um, we are going to now bring up the uh, other panel members. Uh, so uh, I'm going to invite first uh, Yanis Athanasiadis, uh, who, who is going to come up. Uh, Yanis is, um, is a professor of artificial intelligence and data science at Wageningen University in, in the Netherlands. Um, and he has been part of AGMIP since the very first meeting. Um, we also uh, uh, have Meta Duvari, who is online. Uh, Meta is a senior scientist at the International Institute for Tropical Agriculture, uh, which is a part of the CGIAR. Uh, she's also the chief data scientist for the Excellence in Agronomy Initiative and spearheads CG efforts uh, on the operationalization of FAIR standards. Um, and I'm going to give a, a very quick uh, introduction of some of my own work on this and then have invited each of the panel members uh, to, to give a very short presentation before we'll have a moderated discussion. But before I begin, I see people standing around the back. I invite you now to come forward. There's actually many chairs in this hidden part of the room. So you are invited to interrupt my talk by walking up and finding a chair uh, and get, surf, get yourself comfortable. Um, thank you. All right, so I'm going to kick off by, uh, by providing some perspectives on new tools uh, for food system challenges. And I want to bring a couple top topics up, and I realize I'm not in full screen mode. Let's do this right. All right, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is uh, a kind of new concept around what we call climatic impact drivers, which were developed within the, the IPCC uh, as a way of better focusing climate information around the specific conditions that lead to impacts for the things that we care about. So we looked all across many sectors in the IPCC, but I've pulled out this one table here, which has a row on cropping systems. And I know, I, th I think this projector is a little blurry. My apologies if it maybe it was just corrected. Uh, but there's a list here of about 30 different types of climate conditions that we know affect various things. And you can see that many of these are identified with impacts on the agricultural sector. And we can say in general that, that many of these are hazards, but in some cases, Warmer, warmer temperatures may benefit a crop uh, in a cold region or, or could be detrimental in another region. So rather than calling them generally hazards, uh, we use this climatic impact drivers term. But you'll notice here that there are many different aspects and we need to move beyond consideration of just average conditions. Uh, crop models have a, a set number of variables that are typically included in, a, in an input weather file. Um, but of course, we, we need to look at the average conditions, the episodic extremes, the interactions between these climate conditions, the compounding and sequential hazards and extreme events. Uh, so this is an area that is a little bit of a challenge. And I've done a very simple analysis, mostly based on my own impressions here, of the areas that the crop models currently do well. I've put green stars. Uh, areas that, that models typically include as a response, but maybe there's room for improvement, I've put a, blue, a light blue star. Areas that might be added in a soft coupling, for example, with a coastal flooding model, uh, I've put as a darker blue star. And then uh, some of these uh, areas you'll also notice are generally missing. We, we don't have things like hail uh, appearing in many of the crop models. Uh, it's sometimes because we don't have the function, sometimes we don't have the inputs, uh, but these are all areas that we could improve. And there's some of these I've, I've put little red dots on just to indicate that, that we have some functions, but we've also clearly identified other areas that could be improved, like water logging, better representations of pests and diseases, thinking about the agricultural laborers in addition to the crop impacts of, of heat uh, and some other topics like that. Uh, the other topic I wanted to put on the table for this panel discussion is uh, the idea of developing high quality configurations uh, as a foundation for multiple applications. So this is some work uh, that was done by Luke Monholland, who's somewhere in the room, uh, and, and uh, some work that we put in together, where we have set up on a very high performance computer cluster at NASA, um, resolution for the entire state of Iowa. We are running the DSAT uh, series maize and crop grow soybean models so that we can understand uh, impacts uh, over different years. And this is run at a, a 30 meter resolution so that we can link into some of the highest quality, high resolution satellite information. Um, but when we look at the overall spectrum of what is coming for agricultural lands now, we have new data sets coming off of combines, drones, remote sensing from, from space. Uh, we have new tools that, that are capable of assimilating these data into land system models, uh, potentially into crop models. Uh, 
uh, but there are structural challenges that we need to, to face uh, to make use of all of these data. Um, and, and we also are going to hear more about machine learning in a moment on how we can make sense of it all. Uh, the last slide I have here is, is thinking about new tools to understand the future. We've already heard this in several times, uh, but the, the question of scenarios and storylines are, are fundamental to what we do in our agricultural models and assessments. Um, this is a, a portion of a figure that I often show uh, indicating areas that you can't really predict in a predictive sense, you can't forecast, but when we think about the conditions of the future, we need to ask questions around how climate is changing, how market influences are shifting, uh, changes in policies, socioeconomic growth and, and shifts there, as well as broader questions of environmental sustainability around uh, other topics there. So just as an example, uh, within climate change, we have to think about both average sustained changes, but also extreme events and new pressures on agricultural systems for mitigation and adaptation. Um, markets are changing with new markets, trade subsidies and constraints, new efforts to spread risk and technologies like genetic improvements. Um, we also see policy changes that can incentivize better management practices uh, or farm intensification or, or the opposite. In the socioeconomic side, we've already heard uh, today about shifts in dietary demand, uh, equipment and capacity available for, for uh, various practices, and then broader competitions around land, water, and energy. And uh, in terms of environmental sustainability, larger questions around degradation of, of resources and interactions with ecosystem on the, on the periphery. But of course, all of these things come together and they all interact. And every one of these challenges is in their own right substantial. And when you put them all together, this is why we need to have uh, cohesive storylines and we need to work with other communities uh, and speak with a loud voice in terms of what agricultural uh, sector needs and, and what our models can provide. Um, so yeah, this is the broad challenge here is, can we model this food system development and, and adaptation potential going forward? Uh, that's it for me. And now I'm gonna hand over to Giannis for the next part. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. Uh, uh, very nice to be with you today. Uh, and I'm really excited that we are launching a new uh, research line within AGMIP uh, called AGML for um, agriculture modeling and machine learning. And I think it doesn't make a lot of sense to me to try to persuade you that AI has a potential because it's in the news, it's in the newspapers every day, it has transformed several industries. So, um, and we've seen already a couple of examples that Sibiri have shown, but I'm, I'm sure all of you are aware of how AI is helping us transform data into information either by analyzing remote sensing images, by uh, reading text for us, for helping us all these massively collected data, how to process them and transform them into information. However, if we want to go a step forward, I wonder if AI will be a tool for helping us address food security issues, which is the heart of ACMIP and our community. So uh, instead of giving you examples, I brought up three statements that I would like us to think together and maybe discuss. So the first one is a statement a little bit provocative that I don't expect a chat GPT moment for food security issues. So I don't expect that AI and data driven methods will be able to have a transformative effect into agriculture for the for two reasons. One is because um, food systems are ill-defined problems that we have so many, uh, we uh, have seen already some of those uh, uh, different drivers at different scales, social to biophysical systems, interacting long-term projections. It's highly unlikely that we will be able to have um, a data-driven system that is able to address all that. The other problem with AI is that it relies a lot into data and we don't have enough data in agriculture. So a data first approach that will that we will have a kind of system where we dump a lot of data and it will come back with solutions is both I think unsuitable but also undesirable for our problems. We need to have 
stakeholders, policymakers, society into the design of our future. It's not going to happen by technology itself. So with uh, the Agamal community, what we want to do is to make use of all these data-driven technologies, machine learning, artificial intelligence for better understanding our system, for improving our models. And to do that, we need a use-inspired hybrid approach where process-based models and data-driven models work together, where we use each one of them for what is good and help us fill in the gaps, maybe uh, make better use of the little data we have so that we better calibrate our models, that uh, we replace model components when we are uncertain about certain interactions, but also in a way that is inclusive and responsible. So for solving the right problems for the right reasons. And last but not least, the way we want to launch this activity is from intercomparing the AGMIP way, look into what is good and what is not good, uh, do it with scientific rigor and set up a set of protocols where we can prove to what extent machine learning and data-driven methods can help us improve our models and address food security issues. And for that, I would like to invite you all into our working session tomorrow and uh, very happy that we will start this discussion uh, these days in New York. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Giannis. Um, so our next speaker is online. And uh, Meta, I can uh, drive your slides from here, or it looks like we just stopped so you can share your screen uh, if you're able. Sure, let's give this a try. It worked, of course, when I um, tried it earlier. So hopefully you can see my screen now. We can see the screen. If you could go full slides, that would be great. Perfect. Perfect. Good. Well, thank you for having right. me. First uh, hold of all. on one minute. Hold on one minute. I was looking at the podium, but apparently we lost the, the projected uh, screen. So hold on one second. It's not on your if end. If it's an issue, hours. you can run them. All right. Now it's working. Thank you. Great. OK. Um, thanks very much, first of all, for having me. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. Sorry I couldn't join you in person. Uh, but I'm glad to be talking about some of these uh, you know, in, the, in this plenary and talking about new tools. Um, what I'm going to do is tell a little story um, that, that starts with data as a foundation, because I think a lot of the stuff we've been talking about um, has been about data. There are things you can accomplish in a data-driven way that there are things you can't. Um, the, the foundation of a lot of the, the modeling work uh, that, that is being talked about in this conference, though, is uh, data. And so um, what we're trying to do is being able to, at the, at the beginning, at the very start, when data is collected, uh, try to make sure it's standardized. So we have a tool for uh, collecting data from, from uh, controlled trials, ag station types of trials, and we have this tool, DataScribe, that allows you to build uh, standardized data collection forms with the, with the standards compliant variables, uh, with standardized choice lists and with modules and questions that can be shared. Um, I've given you sort of a sense of what that looks like. The idea is to make the data collected across projects, across efforts, comparable, interpretable, and aggregatable. So this is where sort of the, 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 the foundation um, is in, in our view. Uh, what this looks like is, is we have um, data variables that are linked, you know, you could put in uh, a, a certain term, I could put in a certain term or a question, um, call it a certain thing for variables, but in the end, you're going to be tying this one thing to a community standard. So we're trying to standardize right from the basis. We have choice lists that are, that are standardized so that when you're uh, deploying these surveys uh, in the field with farmers, to the extent possible, you're already standardizing responses that come back. So the contents of cells are standardized. Uh, there are modules there uh, uh, that are blocks, essentially re re reusable standardized questions. Uh, you can either use individual uh, blocks or individual questions that, that come from different surveys. So this is a sort of a, a way of, of not um, uh, reinventing the wheel every time you want to do a survey. So what it does, of course, is 
Uh, you're, you're trying to ensure that similar and standardized data is collected across projects. You're saving time uh, when building a form, an ODK form, for instance, although this could work uh, in other uh, uh, ways as well. Um, and you can share part or whole surveys. So that's, again, the time savings. Um, we're also in the business of standardizing old data. So, so um, this is the CARA project that's, that's allowing you to, this is a, a sort of a very fresh off the, the press um, uh, uh, website, uh, carib-data.org. Um, we, we are looking at data sets that are required for the models that we're running, the modeling exercises, both machine learning and um, uh, crop models and empirical models. Um, and trying to, to focus on the fertilizer data. So you see here almost 100,000 observations uh, that are available, uh, mostly under CC license. Um, you can look at a, a sort of a, a view of where they, the, the, the data sit, where they come from, and you can download that data and use it. Right now it's focused on fertilizer. We'll soon be um, broadening the sets here uh, that are available. Now, once you have that data, you need to provide access to it. Uh, the Carib website I just showed you is one way of doing that, but we also have this, this database, this data pool, uh, that includes data that's coming in from um, uh, the, the data collected through tools like Datascribe or, or other tools that collect data standardized, uh, as well as the legacy data that's standardized through the Carib workflow and the R-based workflow that I just showed you. Um, this allows you to search for the data. It allows you to, to, to aggregate the data or it aggregates the data really when you do the search um, and you can download the data. Um, and we're moving towards having that downloaded as machine learning ready or model ready. Uh, we still have a ways to go with, with, with the model ready part of it. Uh, but you can see here, um, well, let me show you some of the parts of it first. So uh, you, can, you can clean the data. There's a basic survey data cleaner that allows you to get the data in socioeconomics um, tool ready format like Stata or SPSS, for instance, um, you have a public and a private data pool because we recognize that not all data, as soon as it's collected, will be made public uh, and people will need to, to interact with that data first. So that's, that's the private part of it. Um, and you can see this human readable data, you can download it in a human re readable format or um, a Carib ready format that conforms to the Carib uh, scripts um, at, or you know, conform it with the ICASA variables. Um, so this is quite nice. This is going to allow us to, to get it closer to model-ready format, we hope, um, using some of the translators that, that have been developed through AgMIP. Uh, so this is the sort of the full view from collecting the data, uh, getting a, a collected data or old data standardized, and then making it accessible. Now, the last part of this, of course, is using that data. And here where, uh, what I'm showing you is, is uh, uh, AgWise, which is a collaborative framework to try and generalize a set of scripts, um, uh, models, um, model approaches, machine learning approaches to be able to provide tailored recommendations right now focused on fertilizer application, uh, but, but they're also field validated through the workflows uh, of the Excellence in Agronomy Initiative. Um, so, so I'm not going to dwell on this in, in any particular detail, but uh, suffice it to know that, that this workflow uses both the machine learning uh, quests and uh, some crop models, VSAT in particular, as, as part of the workflow. Um, and this, this has been generated, this is the, what I'm showing you here, the map I'm showing you is um, recommendations generated for some counties uh, in, in Kenya. This is at the sub-county level uh, with recommended rates of DAP and, and CAN can, um, for what the government we asked the government, we asked the ministry, what, what, what would you like? Would you like to sh to, for farmers to realize um, um, uh, a profit increase or a yield increase? And what we were told is, uh, give us some recommendations that aim for about a 30% increase over current maize grain yields. Um, and so this is the work that was done um, to, 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 to realize that. Um, and and uh, where we make use of, of the data that we're that I just talked about that's been standardized in a variety of ways. Now this kind of effort, this is AgWise, but there are other efforts in excellence in agronomy uh, that look at uh, planting date in South Asia, for instance, um, irrigation timing in in um, Egypt, uh, the Mena re region that Vinay can tell you more about. He's right there, I think. Um, and, and other such um, efforts. So we're trying to trying to generalize these efforts, uh, but the point here is that everything is, is dependent on data, so we start with the data. 
I think that's pretty much all I want to say. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, Meta. Um, I'm going to invite Sibri to, to rejoin us up here at the at the table. Um, I'm going to ask just a brief question, then we'll open it up to the to the full questions uh, in our last 10 minutes or so here. Uh, so, to the panel, maybe if you could each give a a quick uh, thought on um, the question that I think Sibri also hit on, which is, are these really new tools, or is it that these tools have taken a while to penetrate into the agricultural modeling community? Are are these tools that have been demonstrated successfully? in other fields or in other regions of the world, maybe then, then where you would like to see them applied. So uh, maybe Sibri, I'll call on you first if, if you have some initial thoughts on that. Well, um, among the tools that I mentioned, certainly remote sensing is not a new tool. It's been around for 50 years, if, more, if not more. Uh, but what has changed um, quite a lot recently is the granularity and um, the timeliness of the data that uh, so the technology has evolved but the science behind it has not really changed um, the same actually applies to many of the methods in machine learning and deep learning and whatever we put under the umbrella of uh, artificial intelligence um, i remember well over 20 years ago people were already working with uh, artificial neural networks in ways that are quite similar to uh, what is being done today. What has changed today is the amount of data available and the processing power. So um, I would say that I'm not sure that uh, the science has fundamentally evolved at that level. Uh, I think the computational capabilities and the amount of data certainly have. And in some of the um, particular cases that um, relate to imagery, uh, many of what we do in the environmental sciences has been uh, developed in the uh, medical imaging domain. So a lot of uh, um, mathematical convolutional methods and others have already been used, especially in cancer research. So. That's not really new. Um, the application domain is new. Um, I cannot really comment. I'll let perhaps uh, Ioannis uh, comment on the uh, large language models and others. Yes. Um, well, I, I agree with uh, Sibiri on this. Maybe another couple of new uh, or different uh, perspectives there. One has to do with the maturity of the software ecosystem around AI. So things that we could do 20 years ago, now we can just do them really much better because this software is so well maintained and professionalized. Huh? So it's not only the availability of data and computational power, but it's also the quality of the software that we have from there. Um, and, and I think that has been transformative. The other thing is that apart from the traditional machine learning uh, approaches which are focusing in regression, classification problems, and so on. There has been a lot of focus in other less, um, let's say, well-known approaches that focus on optimization, on um, uh, reinforcement learning, learning from rewards, which could be particularly useful uh, for our application domains. So I think these are also new tools that are emerging and we, uh, that, that we need to pay attention to them. Thanks, Yanis. Meta, any, any uh, comments here? Yeah, sure. Um, I think, you know, there, there's a big gorilla or elephant in the room if we go by, the, by Jessica's analogy. Um, and that's sharing data. Uh, it's still very difficult in our domain particularly uh, to get people to share data. Um, and and that's, that's an issue. I mean, even AgMIP, um, th there isn't openly shared data. Um, I, I tried again today and the, and the website doesn't work. So it's a, it's a, it's a you know, I think we need to, to, to have a call to, to commit to um, sharing data and to, and to make it, you know, to, to get it to where we can all benefit from it. Um, I think we lag be behind the biomedical domain uh, in this. The biomedical domain has done a lot. Uh, for instance, to, to looking at um, uh, uh, privacy, you know, uh, personally identifiable information. This is something that people say, oh, my data contains uh, personally identifiable information. I cannot make it open. 
uh, with, in the biomedical domain with the COVID data set, actually, um, they instituted something called Open Safety, uh, which allowed people to, to bring their scripts to the data. It's a different paradigm. So bring your scripts to the data and data, um, use the synthetic data to, to develop your scripts, analyze the data that's that's sitting in the in a database that's not allowed to be downloaded or um, otherwise uh, compromised. But go away with the with the results of your analysis. I mean, these are these are tools I think that are already there, um, but we're behind in the agricultural domain. So um, I would say that that there is some catch up that we need to play. May I add yeah, um, uh, something else? Uh, what Mede is saying is truly correct, but also based on what uh, Sibiris said before, I think there is another dimension which has to do that we need an interdisciplinary approach to interact with these new. Uh, communities. Eh? So what Jessica was saying before, uh, to sit in rooms with people that we have totally different backgrounds. And uh, a key issue with the AI community is that they really want to have an impact in the world. They don't know how. So they are focused in business problems. There is a huge uh, initiative uh, called AI for Good. They don't know how to bring their methods into our problems. And there, I think it's also our responsibility to open up our data, standardize our tasks, and share the, the challenges with others so that we kind of um, <coughs> build a bridge between what new tools bring and what is wh what our problems are. And the medical sector was very successful in doing that. And they managed to have this feedback loop to make the machine vision community focus on their problems and their requirements. So I think it's our responsibility to start moving to that direction as well. Thank you. Um, I'm looking for a, a quick question from the audience. Uh, I see two hands. Maybe we'll take those two and then I'm worried we're going to run out of time. So yeah, here comes the microphone. Jerry Nelson first, please. Uh, the the data availability problem, uh, you know, it, it's my data. I don't want to give it to you. Is pr partly driven by the difficulty of collecting the data, and I wonder if the CG has thought about the idea of having standardized data collection processes built into fields that uh, people can actually go out and use. Put the weather stations, put the soil moisture collection, do the collection at the end with non-destructive sampling, and have it in a standardized way so that people can just go in and do their experiments, and the data then is automatically available. It becomes available because all those tools already exist to send that stuff out to the web, make it available wherever you're located, but where everybody and anywhere else in the world is located. Meta, would you like to respond? Sure. Um... Um, I think I think we're getting towards that model. I mean, I, I one one option is IoT. I mean, you know, you could just um, for soil moisture things like that, weather stations. That data could be, you know, is being collected in the ways you describe. Um, the the data that I was referring to was more the the trial data, and I think you're talking about that as well, Jerry. Um, the 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 idea there is that you're collecting the data, these tools that I described. Uh, you would collect the data they and you you know with the click of a button you would you would have to click that button but it would be uploaded uh to a data management system and then automate automatically go into the database that's our workflow right now um in the in the data pool or database that i that i showed you so it's getting close to that model um by the end of the year we should be at least at a beta uh with the whole you know workflow um and being closer to what you imagine and I think you're right. We do need something like that. Thank you, Meta. Uh, last question from Minpei. Yeah, actually, I have a following question about this. Uh, uh, I, I totally agree that agric agriculture maybe is not so sufficient uh, for data. As, uh, but with the uh, development of uh, agent uh, technologies, so my question is about what are the impacts of AI technologies on the uh, our conventional uh, data production and uh, uh, sharing uh, system or approach in agriculture. So what are the opportunities? So shall we uh, think uh, maybe uh, beforehand about our uh, 
conventional, conventional, uh, sorry, conventional data uh, collection methods, or is are there any new emerging uh, data production uh, approach? I'm going to invite Giannis to, to give a uh, initial response. Yeah, um, I think uh, that the, the, what you bring up is very important because actually this is part of the challenge. Are we just going to um, take benefit of what AI brings and see to what way it fits uh, their developments fit to our problems or if we can actually start influencing these developments by bringing up new questions but that requires also action from our side yeah and uh, to be very honest i don't have a very clear answer on that yeah i might just add one more thing of course you know agmip is also producers of primary outputs from models which be, which can serve into machine learning approaches so there's the observational side there's also new model outputs which become a basis original knowledge on which artificial intelligence might go forward all right, I know we're, we're digging into the lunchtime here. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm gonna uh, dismiss the panel in one second, but I'm just gonna make a very quick announcement. Um, the, the lunches, Eric, am I correct that they're upstairs? Um, Eric, go to you, please. Uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, it's fourth floor. Um, I believe there will be box lunches, so you can just grab it. The tables are set up for, um, you know, the, as we've said before, the regions by, by continent. Um, I will say, uh, if there's any steering committee, or, um, steering council or executive committee members in the room right now, or our two observers who are going to be in the steering committee council meeting, I recommend you stand up right now and start making your way so you can go grab your box and bring it into the, the boardroom, which is right here outside. That's just for steering council and uh, executive committee. Everyone else, you can stay upstairs or if you would like to take it outside or something that you, you can. All right. Or to a different room. Thanks, Eric. And the last announcement, this has been a morning full of plenary presentations and panels, and I know many of you are jet lagged, so thank you very much for your patience and attention. Uh, this afternoon is much more active. There will be pa uh, paper presentations and then the working sessions. So please look for which room you want to join uh, after lunch. We will, there will be some groups here, but we will be spread around this building. Eric, do you have a last announcement? Yeah, so on that point, so we are in the presidential level. This is, if, if your room says presidential level is this, this is presidential one. It's in there. Second floor, we're on the third floor right now. Second floor is seminar. So seminar one, two, and three. And first floor, there's garden room one and two. I mean, it says in the program with which floor it's on. But just this is presidential. That's presidential one. Seminar below and then the garden rooms, first floor. All right. Let's thank our panel one last time and have a great lunch.